Good morning, I'm Olivia Proya. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Daniel Booth. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our first half hour. Graduation season is just a few weeks away and many students are looking to continue their education. Galat Malamed gives us some tips on how to pay for grad school. Plus, Syracuse announced this year's commencement speaker. Danielle Bullock will be live in studio to show us student reaction. And the university is offering a new program that can help save lives. And it isn't CPR training. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story. Oh. Our top story this hour. The year is coming to an end, and for some seniors, that means going to grad school. But higher education can be very expensive, and student loans make up for the largest amount of non-housing debt. Our Galat Malamed joins us live with some ways to pay for that next step. Good morning, Daniel and Olivia. I'm outside the Office of Financial Aid on the Syracuse campus, and it's the place to go to get help paying for your Syracuse education. What about seniors heading off to grad school? Here are some finance tips to know before you step foot on your new campus. Nicer weather on campus is just one sign that graduation is quickly approaching. For some seniors like Becky Walker, that means grad school is quickly approaching as well, and the cost that comes with it. Mine is a five-year program, and it'll actually be about fifty dollars to $60,000 cheaper than a four-year undergraduate degree, which is nice, but it's still a hefty cost. Many undergrads might be familiar with the Parent PLUS loans from FAFSA. Well, FAFSA also has Graduate PLUS loans to cover what university merit or financial aid does not. But the biggest difference between undergrad and graduate aid is that now parents' finances are not taken into account. You could be 21 and going to grad school. You could be, you know, on the royal family of Saudi Arabia, or you could just be, you know, a homeless person. It's all based on your income, and every, every, everyone who goes to grad, not everyone, but most people who go to grad school don't have an income. Kaplan suggests that in addition to whatever money a student gets from their university, they should search independently because there's scholars from outside organizations for things you might not even think about. Do your homework, go on the web, there's scholarship, you know, if you're, if you're the son of a firefighter or a daughter of a nurse, some of their scholarships like out there for some of those things. Walker says her grad school told her about the state of Massachusetts loan forgiveness program, but says finding out helpful information like that on your own could sometimes be tough. I don't know where I would have ever found that online or something like that. There's like some sort of central database for like all that kind of stuff. That would be really nice to have rather than just Googling it and then hoping something comes up. Central database would be nice, but here's one helpful website to go to. It's hesk.ny.gov, and for New York State residents, there's seven loan forgiveness programs similar to what Walker's getting in Massachusetts. There's also, there's also three federal loan forgiveness programs. Some helpful tips because, believe it or not, graduation is just over four weeks away. Live outside the financial aid office, Gilat Malamed, Mornings on the Hill. Thank you, Gilat. Next year, Syracuse University budget will actually include a boost in student financial aid. The university announced an, an additional $280 million, which will help support future students and students currently living on campus. I think it provides a better incentive for people to stay here, for people to come here in the first place, uh, and especially to stay all four years if they do come here, because if it does get hard, then who knows if they're going to transfer out because they can't afford it here. This boost in financial aid is part of the initiative called Invest Syracuse. The university says the goal of Invest Syracuse is to give students the opportunity to earn an education regardless of their socioeconomic background. So today I was really disappointed when I had to dig my winter coat back out of my closet. I put it away and then here we are again. It's, it's back out. And luckily our very own Kendra Sheehan is live out on University Ave to tell us what to expect. Yeah, thanks guys. Lucky me. Uh, you know, it may have felt like spring yesterday, but Mother Nature is here to remind us that we still live in Syracuse. Yesterday, people were out on the quad soaking up the sunshine. Today, a little bit different. I broke out my heavy jacket. I'm even wearing gloves. It's around 35 degrees right now, and I even felt some snowflakes as I walked in today. But let's take a look as we head into the rest of the day. So we might not be seeing the sun right now, but don't worry. It is expected to peek through those clouds around noon and into the early afternoon hours. But it may be a little bit cold, but at least we'll see some sun and you can start to work on that summer tan. Unfortunately, the sun won't warm things up too much, the temperature only reaching a high of 41 degrees. 
It's going to be a little bit windy today, but the good news is we won't be seeing any of that rain. Also, roadways are looking clear, so you shouldn't expect any delays as you head into work. So be sure to grab that extra jacket, maybe some gloves, but you won't need your umbrella today. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Kendra Sheehan. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you, Kendra. So as we mentioned, commencement is just about a month away. And thousands of students and their families will gather on May 12th in the Dome. And now we know who's speaking at commencement. Mornings on the Hill's Danielle Bullock is live with the story. Thank you, Olivia and Daniel. You are totally right. Graduation is only four weeks away, and if you haven't checked your SU email recently, you might want to. The university has announced the 2019 commencement speaker will be Mary Daly. She's a president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and she's, of course, an SU alum. I talked to students to get their reactions, and initially, they weren't, they weren't able to recognize her name. I read who the commencement speaker is, but I've never heard of her in my life. My initial reaction was just like, who is she? I got an email about her, but I don't know who she is. 1994 graduate of the Maxwell School, where she received her PhD in economics. She has many impressive accomplishments, but she actually dropped out of high school at age 15. I think that's a really big deal to go from being a high school dropout to now being the commencement speaker over a university with over 20,000 students. I also asked students what they wanted to hear from our this year's speaker, and most of them will say they want a speaker to be effective, straight to the point, and timely. Again, commencement will be Sunday, May 12th in the Dome. Reporting live in the studio, I'm Danielle Bullock for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Danielle. Coming up for Mornings on the Hill, the owner of Ambition Upstate joins us in studio to discuss how his company is changing sneaker culture. Stick around. Mornings on the Hill will be right back. If you're 21 and trying to hit the bars on Marshall Street, you may want to think twice. Coming up. Welcome back. The U.S. is experiencing the largest measles outbreak in, in decades. Just yesterday, New York City declared a public health emergency following a spike in cases in certain communities. And the outbreak is raising concern among both parents and students, but medical school director Karen Nardella says there's no reason to panic. The people who are unvaccinated, which is again a very small number with waivers, they would be at risk more if they traveled like downstate or internationally, somewhere where there are active cases. Luckily, at this point, there are no cases here. While Central New York hasn't seen any cases yet, students who haven't gotten the measles vaccine are strongly encouraged to do so. Measles are highly contagious, and some symptoms include coughing, body aches, fevers, and a full body rash. The State Liquor Authority and the DMV are joining Syracuse Police in a month-long crackdown on fake IDs and establishments that sell alcohol to underage people. This in addition to efforts to restrict underage consumption throughout the year. Bars and businesses around campus and across the state will be subject to random raids. Governor Cuomo says anyone caught breaking the law will be held accountable. A group of SU students have created a business which sports gambling companies are investing $500,000 to a $1 million in. Their company is called LFG, which stands for Live for the Game. It'll, it'll, it'll cover sporting events from the perspective of fans. SU senior and founder Griffin Whitman says he wants the content to be a combination of ESPN coverage and Barstool Sports. The partners will begin traveling in an RV and covering different sporting events across the country at the end of May. Their first gig will be the Indy 500. Good morning, I'm Sam Carter and this is your Orange Buzz Report. Now what's trending here on campus on social media? Let's check this out first. All right, we got, we got Jess uh, and she says, I have literally, so she's super serious about it, been telling my BF, I'm assuming boyfriend, for a whole year, that's a while, that uh, at the Great Khalid is gonna come to Syracuse for block party and her dream came true. So buddy, she's clairvoyant and she gets her way. Hold on to this one. Uh, next, we got, uh, I got Anthony here, new house I think. Uh, Khalid is coming to Syracuse for block party, nowhere near 
enough popcorn for this. So Orville Redenbacher is ready. I think we got enough popcorn. Uh, and then what would Block Party and Mayfest as a whole be without <laughs> memories? Um, <laughs> Uh, we got Gabriel, and he's talking about that uh, block party was epic, got off the bus, got, off, got to see the bus boys and RHPC, and he even added a little bit of a photo there, which is pretty solid, so he did his thing all right. Um, that's your Orange Buzz. I'm Sam Carter for Mornings on the Hill. Thank you, Sam. Fashion is constantly evolving and that is not stopping some people from taking the advantage of the opportunity to adopt their own style. Our Tamar Turner is live in studio with the owner of Ambition Upstate, a sneaker and clothing boutique in Armory Square. Thanks guys. So I'm joined this morning with Nick Jerusso, who is the owner of Ambition Upstate, a clothing and sneaker boutique which recently relocated to Armory Square May of last year. So Nick, what, what actually sparked your involvement in wanting to bring this boutique to the Syracuse community? I've been in Syracuse my whole life. There's always been a big heavy thing for fashion and sneakers and the culture itself. And there's never been a store open. So I figured one day, <coughs> excuse me, instead of talking about it, I just decided to put it together. And here I am just about three years later. Okay. So now with, with deciding what brands come into Ambition Upstate, whether you want to, I, I, I read that you do try to appeal to like the local brands. I know a lot of people are kind of oh, making absolutely. their own clothing lines and everything. How do you what is kind of the decision making process in bringing in different brands, whether it be different sneakers, whether it be clothes, jackets? How do you decide that? I guess it's pretty much whatever I'm whatever I'm told to go out and find is pretty much what I try to go out and find. So, you know, if you want some Reeboks, I can do that. But if you want your high end J's, I can also do that, too. Okay. So I also try to keep, you know, like your 50, 60 dollar pairs. But then I also have your couple hundred, couple thousand dollar pairs. Okay. So I try to. You know, like me, like I can't spend a couple thousand dollars on a pair of shoes, but if I find a pair of shoes I like for 50 bucks, I'm gonna cop it Go for 50 it. bucks. Right. Yeah, absolutely, Go absolutely. It. Okay, so now kind of still talking about the sneakers, I see you have on the illustrious ones right here. <laughs> uh, what's, a, what's a common misconception when it comes to, to, to collecting sneakers and to then reselling them to the public, whether it be like OGs or anything like that? What do you think people don't know that you think they should, or what do you think they kind of assume that may not be the case? Pretty much buying into the hype. You know, you have a lot of people who just buy what they think or they hear what other people talk about, like, this is going to be hot, this is going to be hot. So you see that trend. But what a lot of younger kids don't understand is, you know, stop following those people's footsteps. Like, whatever you like, just cop what you like and just wear what you that. like. Right. You know, you don't got to follow anyone else's footsteps. Make your own path into what you want. For sure. But So now, with that, with that plan in mind, how do you personally appeal to... Um, the, the crowd, the, the children crowd, how do you get them to like buy these sneakers to not feed into the hype, to be hype beasts as they call them? I mean, I guess it really all depends. You got to kind of, you know, put it in perspective. So, you know, just as like if you come to the store there, I got a couple thousand dollar pair sitting next to a fifty dollar pair of shoes. Okay. They look literally the same exact shoe, mm -hmm. it's the same exact color, but you have, you know, something that's backed by Kanye versus something that's backed by, you know, a regular Reebok shoe. Gotcha. But you know, I've also been doing this since I was probably 15. I just turned 29 this year. Okay. So I just, I know a lot of people in the culture already. And mm -hmm. a lot of the older people that I know also have younger kids. Okay. So when they come in, you know, just chit chat with them, tell them what I like, show them what I like. They show me what they like and just pretty much go from there. Okay. And so now talking about um, your relocation. Yep. So originally you were on Salina Street yep. and now you're in West Fayette at Armory Square. So yep. how, how did that relocation help propel your business if it did or, or what did that do for you as a store? Did you, how did you prompt that relocation? That's a really good question. Just a lot more foot traffic. You know, I was in Little Italy on the north side. It used to be a great, great spot in the city about five to ten years ago. But now you're starting to see Armory Square kind of pick up or Little Italy kind of left off. So just moving down there itself, it's a lot more foot traffic, a um, lot more drive-by cars. Get a lot more car traffic down there, right across the street from the Marriott Hotel. So that also helps, you know, helps me too. Okay. Um, I'm also more central in New York, okay. or Syracuse, right there. So instead of me just being on the north side, me being down in Armory Square, now I can kind of make the commute for other people that were further away, mm -hmm. not as far now, now since okay. I'm right down in Armory Square. Most definitely. Yep. Okay, so now as a, I know we spoke a little earlier, as a Foot Locker, former employee, <laughs> as, a, as a sneaker connoisseur, if I walk in Ambition Upstate right now, what's the, what's the hottest sneaker? What, what, are, what are my, as a, as a new oh, customer, man. what are you trying to get me to buy right now? Just to be biased, I'm gonna make you buy a pair of ones. Okay. Just because that's, that's just, I love, I love ones. Okay. 
got a lot of ones, but also I have a lot of your Kanye shoes down there. Okay. I also got, you know, a pair of V-Lone Air Force Ones, which is, yeah, they made probably less than like maybe 500, 500 pairs of those. Pair, yeah, right, I had yeah. to go down, you know, go down in New York City, put in a raffle, wait like 14, 15 hours for the raffle and stuff like that. But literally anything that I got down there, I literally have a little bit for everybody's taste, a little bit for everybody's wallet. So it's, okay. I have literally everything down there for everybody. Okay. And can we just, um, we're talking about ones, we're talking about jerseys. Can you just put your feet up on this table for me just to show if you're, okay. So got the black and red here. He said, he actually told me this was the last pair yeah, um, of, of, of sneakers that he bought. bought he said myself. he had to discipline himself a little bit. So we're glad for that. Um, I know you just mentioned traveling to New York. So yeah. granted, you're, you're based here in Syracuse University. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a travel. So something that you do for your business, basically to help it exceed and everything like that. Do you have any plans for expansion to go oh, outside absolutely. the Syracuse community? How do, oh, you, absolutely. how do you want to do that? Like, how do you want to dive into that? <clears throat> I guess pretty much just following my five-year plan. You know, okay. when I started this, I had a five-year plan. Once five years hits, I plan on having at least two, maybe the third in the works. Okay. About three years into it, I had a couple, you know, mishaps here and there, but I'm right back on track now. So my next step is to hopefully go somewhere down south, North Carolina, South Carolina, maybe even okay. Florida, try to expand down there a little okay. bit more. But I've been born and raised in Syracuse, so I want to I wanna keep this here in Syracuse. Okay. I, I, got love, I got a lot of love for Syracuse. Okay. Yeah. So I think you kind of uh, combated what I said a little earlier. I told myself I got to discipline, no more sneakers <laughs> for the rest of the year. But now Nick wants me to, he's, he, uh, you I want to take a trip down to Ambition right now through. after this. Care. So yeah, Definitely so thanks once care. again, Nick. Um, for everybody out there watching, please be sure to check out Ambition Upstate at 327 West Fayette Street, or you can visit their website at www.getambitionupstate.com. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Tamar Turner. Thank you, Tamar. Coming up, one SU organization is working to teach you how to save lives. Yeah. When Mornings on the Hill returns. Welcome back. We know CPR and defibrillator training can save lives. But another course is being offered here at SU that can also help in emergency situations. Our Abigail Fribben joins us live in studio for more information on Stop the Bleed. Thanks guys, that's right. This program is intended to help those who are seriously injured and it gives bystanders the ability to provide potentially life-saving care before paramedics arrive. Stop the Bleed was established in 2015 after the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting where 20 children were killed. And they realized five to seven of those victims, if they had early access to bleeding control, probably would have survived the incident. Paul Smith has trained over 300 Syracuse University students, faculty, and staff. He says the classes are important for those with no other medical training. In my opinion, it's, it's important any place that there's a lot of people. Um, not only Syracuse University, any of the colleges or universities in the area. The class has lots of different techniques to help someone who's injured, but one of the most important things they stress are the ABCs. A. Alert by calling for help. B. Check where the bleed is located. C. Compress to stop the bleed using two methods they'll teach you during the class. Smith says being prepared for anything is crucial for safety. It's, it's sad that we have to think about this, but yet um, getting this these kids out there and getting people trained will hopefully help someone. The program will also be installing these Stop the Bleed kits around every building on campus. And I know I talked a little bit about the ABCs in there, but there is a ton of information that that class provides that I didn't dive into. So if you're interested, make sure to check it out to learn all that you need to know. The class is about an hour long, and once it's completed, you get this certificate. If you want more information or you want to take the class, you can email pjsmith at syr.edu. Reporting live in the studio, I'm Abigail Fridman for Mornings on the Hill. Finally this half hour, singer-songwriter Khalid is headlining the SU Block Party this year and he'll be joined by Rico Nasty and Kenny Beats. The gates of the Carrier Dope open at 6.30 on April 26th. Starting today at noon, you can pre-order your tickets on cues.com. Well, that'll do it for us this morning. I'm Olivia Proya. Thanks for watching. And I'm Daniel Booth. Don't go away. Mornings on the Hill continues right after the break.
Good morning, I'm Landon Wexler. Thanks and for joining us on Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Alexandria Bennett. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our second half hour. The weather fades away. Construction season is in full swing. Find out where construction is going to be happening on and off campus. An art exhibit is bringing some plants to campus in a unique way. Find out when you can check it out. We've heard of colors representing our personality, or maybe even a meme, but how about a font? Find out what visual art students are doing on campus to make this project possible. All that, plus your weather and orange sports, coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. <clears throat> Our top story this half hour, construction season is in full swing, and you'll be seeing plenty of it around campus. Our Fernando Garcia Frances Chini is live in studio to break down some of the bigger renovations happening in the Orange neighborhood. That's right, guys. I know it can be hard trying to keep up with all the construction going on on campus, so I'm here to explain some of the bigger ones that you should keep your eye on. First off is Archbold Gymnasium. Building A is almost done. Just some final installation of finishes and mill work. As for building B, mechanical, plumbing, and electric work continues and roof installation begins this month. Steel installation in building C will be complete by the end of the month and the pool installation process continues. Renovations in Archbold are expected to be finished by fall 2019. And if you want to watch the construction process live, go to the link below. Next is the National Veterans Resource Center. This space will be used to advance help offered to veterans and their families. It's just right across the street from our studio. The steel installation is complete and next the con contractor will start pouring the concrete floor slabs. Pedestrians and drivers should follow the signs in the construction area like the ones right here and a single lane of traffic will remain along South Krause Avenue from Waverly Avenue to Marshall Street this spring. The project will be opened in January 2020 and if you want to follow the construction progress visit the link below. Moving on to Hendricks Chapel. Air conditioning will be added to the chapel that's expected to be completed in May next month, just before commencement events take place. And at Krause College, the exterior restoration stage, the final phase, will take place this summer. All three cupolas, like the one right here, will be removed from the roof and placed on the western side of the building. This will happen immediately after commencement, and they will be reinstalled in August. Finally, let's go to the Hall of Languages. The lecture rooms 107 and 207 will get new auditorium seating, carpeting, paint and heating and cooling updates. Renovations will be done over the summer. Tomorrow, there will be a campus construction update town hall meeting at the Schaefer Art Building from 4 to 5 p.m. Reporting live in Studio 4 Mornings on the Hill, I'm Fernando Garcia Franceschini. Thank you so much, Fernando. It's time for another check of your weather today. Kendra Sheehan is live out on University Ave to show us what to expect. Well guys, I was a little disappointed when I woke up this morning. I thought spring had finally arrived, but not yet. You won't be seeing people out in shorts or t-shirts today. I even felt some snowflakes as I was walking in this morning. And I know snow mid-April, it sounds ridiculous, but that's just Syracuse for you. It's around 35 degrees, so make sure you grab that extra jacket, maybe even some gloves. But let's take a look at that five-day forecast and see if we're going to warm up at all. Tomorrow doesn't look much better with only a high of 48 degrees and a few more clouds than we're going to see today. But as we go to the weekend, it's going to be wet on Friday, 70% chance of rain, and you are not going to want to forget your umbrella that day. But it will be warmer at least in the high 60s. Saturday will look a little bit better, temperature around 60 degrees and some sunshine poking through. That's going to look like your best opportunity to break out the shades and pretend that summer is here before we end the weekend with a drop in temperature and pouring rain. So break out the jacket again. It's not spring yet and prepare for a colder day today. Live outside University Ave for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Kendra Sheehan. Back to you guys in the studio. You know, it's a bit of a bummer. I was all in summer gear, shorts, t-shirt. Yeah. Back to jackets, not too fond of that. I'm but so sad. Sorry, we'll have to move on from that. <laughs> a new makeover is bringing some new construction to campus this spring. Improvements are coming to the Shine Student Center. A celebration was held yesterday to the re reveal the renovation plans and honor the Shine Crown family who sponsored the original building. Officials on campus say the goal is to make the student center like a living room where students eat, stay, study, and hang out. 
One student said she couldn't be more excited for the new renovations. China isn't just a place like where we sit and study. It's literally like where we come to for all of our everything for problems with programming, problems with friends, problems with organizations, and I know that in the future that that's not going to get lost. The Student Center will also have more dining options, seating, and lounging space. Well, your commute to campus is expected to get easier in the coming months. Construction is in the works to repair sidewalks, accessibility ramps, and repair the major potholes around the university area. Ro road work will be seen along Comstock, Waverly, and South Krause Avenues between now and July 31st. drive through potholes and rip up your tires. It's pretty frustrating, uh, honestly. You know, I hit a pothole every day and I scream, <laughs> scream words that I probably shouldn't. Don't worry about construction getting in the way of events in the near future. Contractors have agreed to avoid working near Walnut Park as Mayfest rolls around and will limit construction during commencement week. Coming up on here, coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, there is a new ga art gallery on campus that is highlighting the work of graduate art students. Also coming up, we'll tell you about the journalist that's being honored with the Tully Award for free speech. Stay with us for those stories and much more here on Mornings on the Hill. Welcome back. A new art exhibit will open tomorrow at the SU Art Galleries, featuring work from 24 visual and performing arts graduate students. The art explores topics such as re-examination and shaping of reality. The exhibit is titled, Plans Are Cancelled. It's a reflection of the negativity behind canceled plans and the opportunity to instead celebrate new ones. It's spread out over three spaces, which will include the SU Art Galleries, Point of Contact Gallery, and Community Art Folk Center. Well, April is National Poetry Month, and if you didn't already know it, the university is filled with poets and a ton of them and archi archives of poetry. Many in the Orange community have found an escape from life's pressures in the creative writing. That's exactly what the month-long celebration is meant to encourage. Poetry has influenced some students, like Leonza Reyes, to an extent that she published a book filled with her experiences told poetically. If you want to pick up a quick poetic read on campus and support the literature, the resources are available. Whether it's a simple haiku, lyric, or an epic you're looking for, Bird Library has poetry collections on its fifth floor. And for the 14th straight year, the Tully Center here at Newhouse is awarding its Tully Center Award for free speech. The award recognizes journalists from the United States and around the world who face violence and persecution. This year's winner is Filipina journalist Maria Ressa, who has been threatened, in, threatened with jail and harm for her coverage of Filipino government. Tully Center Director Professor Roy Gutterman says it's important to recognize the work of these journalists these people come in and tell their stories and, and tell us that they're still dedicated to doing the, the journalism that we take for granted in the United States, or at least took for granted in the United States. It's uh, sobering and, um, and uh, inspiring to see this. Yes. Russell will be on campus to receive the award on April 24th. Past winners have been from as far away as Azerbaijan. Good morning, I'm Kayla Burton. With commencement coming up soon, the university has announced its highest honor for undergraduate students. We're joined this morning by Nathan Sharon, and who is one of the 12 university scholars. So Nathan, first and foremost, thank you for being here, and huge congratulations. So you are, just so you know, one of 22, about 22,000 undergraduate, undergraduate students who attend this university. You are one of 12 that received this award. What feeling goes through your mind knowing that you have accomplished such a huge award? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, and yeah, it's a huge uh, honor. I feel really humbled to have received it. And um, I've worked really hard since freshman year to, um, to learn as much as I can about the world. I came in as an anthropology major my freshman year. I kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. And um, I've taken a lot of different, um, you know, taken up a lot of challenges and um, doing research projects and long hours and nights in bird. And <laughs> so it feels great to feel like a lot of that has been validated with yeah. this honor. Yeah. I mean, like you just said, coming in from freshman year, you know, you're coming from high school, which is a huge transition for everyone. What, are, what have been some of the biggest challenges along the way 
So, I mean, so far and just in your past? Well, I think for a lot of college students, simply getting acclimated to the university campus is a big challenge. And I know um, for me, freshman year, figuring out like what it was that I wanted to really study or what I wanted to do with my life after I graduated were things that were always on my mind. Um, I think even the level of work and the quality of work that you're expected to produce is another, you know, pretty big challenge that a lot of students had to face. But I think, um, you know, for me in particular, one challenge I think has also been sort of adjusting to like the, you know, campus climate. Mm. So being, you know, as a <laughs> You're member, not joking about that. <laughs> yeah, the campus climate. Yeah, both, you know, in terms of the weather, but also in terms of, you know, where like spaces are for people who are, you know, of different backgrounds and um, so things like that, I think, were some of the biggest challenges I've had to face. You know? You've had a lot of accomplishments. I mean, you're an anthropology major, a minor in Russian, and a part of the honors program, Out of, yeah. and, and plenty more that I can probably <laughs> name. But what has been probably your most rewarding and biggest accomplishment? I'd say, like, right now, finishing up my honors capstone has been, you know, the biggest uh, project, but also the biggest um, obstacle I've had. It's the first time I've taken on a huge research endeavor. And um, so since October 2017, I've been studying LGBTQ activism in New York City. So I've been working with groups like ACT UP. I've been working with millennial activist groups on social media activism um, and trying to understand what the experiential, you know, temporal and um, technological dimensions of contemporary activism in New York City around issues that affect LGBTQ people around the world are. So um, it's been a really dense project. Uh, I've had to pull a lot of different literatures together, um, but I think it's the most rewarding thing I've done in terms of like my academic record. Well, you don't seem to be going through any type of senior slump. Most people at your age are you know, ready to get on out of here, but you are continuing just all the accomplishments that you've been going through. And speaking of, you will be traveling soon. And you want to tell everyone where you're going to be traveling to? Sure. I'm going to Siberia, uh, to the city of Barnal in southern Russia for six weeks in the summer, starting in July and ending in mid-August. We're going to spend some time in Moscow as well. So, yeah, I'm really excited to see what the future holds. And just to wrap this whole thing up, what advice would you give to incoming freshmen or just students who are here right now just trying to make their way through Syracuse? Sure. Um, I guess really to follow your passion. Um, I came in and it took me a while to really figure out what in particular I wanted to study, but once I sort of discovered that passion, I just followed through. And, you know, even though I spent like a lot of time studying, a lot of time, you know, doing work in BIRD, I think a lot of that was stuff that I, I don't really feel like I missed out on too much. I mean, cause I tried to balance both my, my work ethic and the stuff I had to do academically with things that were more socially oriented, but all of it together made the experience mm. holistic and exciting and um, yeah, just an awesome four years. So. Well, Nathan, congratulations once again. Thank you for thank joining you so us. Much. So for Nathan, myself, thank you for joining us for Morning on the Hill. I'm Kayla Burton. Good morning, I'm Kylan Watson with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. The SU women's tennis team wrapped up their final home match for the year inside the Drumlin's Country Club. The 30th ranked Orange lost to the 27th ranked Miami Hurricanes on Sunday. Senior Gabriella Knudsen played her final home match of her SU career. And it's been a fantastic four year journey. Our Faith Kane is live in the studio to tell her story. All-American star Gabrielle Knudsen said her final goodbyes on senior day Sunday in the Drumlins Country Club after losing to the second-ranked tennis player in the country. Knudsen has a few more matches left and her journey to the Salt City was unlike most. Gripping the tape of a tennis racket at age two, Gabriella Knudsen trained and turned herself into a child prodigy. So it was kind of, it was a lot of pressure but also, as I said, like I never questioned it. I never doubted it. I didn't I don't think I even realized. She spent her summers competing in the Czech Republic and the winters in California, but injuries stopped her from competing and instead she took up swimming. It was like kind of a roller coaster ride. She knew she was different. She spent most her time recovering from her athletic lifestyle rather than hanging out with her friends. This is not something normal people do. All my other friends were playing dodgeball and I was at home icing my groin. Friends at school were not even an option after fifth grade. Knutson was homeschooled. My life was basically play tennis in the morning, study, lunch, play tennis, study, sleep. 
And studying wasn't, you know, with friends. It was in the corner on a laptop. Tennis is a lonely sport, and Knutson may have been the only one on the court, but there is always one voice in the crowd louder than the rest. So my mom is the reason for everything in my life. Like, she is, um, like, my hero. Her success led her to four years at Syracuse University. Knutson finished her last match at Drumlins, rounding out the regular season at number 19. I feel good. No, I feel so accomplished. Like, the past four years have been amazing, and they made me so proud. Next up for the child prodigy, more tennis. Enrolling in Durham University to get a Master's of Science in Marketing, all with a tennis scholarship. This time with fewer practices and less pressure. I decided for the next stage of my tennis career that will be a little bit less intense. Knutson and the Orange will match up against Duke on Friday and round out their regular season at Clemson on Sunday. Knutson will then head into the NCAA tournament where she will defend her eighth final ranking from last year. I'm Faith Kane for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Faith. We hear from one group of seniors to another. The SU men's lacrosse team renewed their intense upstate New York rivalry with Cornell. The Orange were trying to avenge last year's tournament loss to the Bears. We start early in the first. Steven Rafis gets the score and started early with a twisting shot. And he scores one to nothing cues. Later on in the first, Brendan Curry gets it to Bradley Voigt, who decides it's his turn to get in on the act. And he scores off a rocket two to nothing orange. Rafis says one is nice, but he wants more. With the pump fake and the score, his second goal of the night, three nothing orange. Cordell showing a little bit of life, though. Connor Fletcher gets it and scores 3-1. Cordell down by two. We head to the second quarter. Q's passing it around now to Peter Durf, who puts it in from long distance. 4-1 Q's. Late third quarter, Nate Solomon gets it. Cordell has him well covered. He throws up the no-look prayer. And it's answered. Somebody calls SportsCenter 9-5 Arch. The Arch won this game by a score of 13-8 on senior night. Coach John Desco had a lot to say about this team's effort, about his team's effort during this game. Stuck with the game plan uh, throughout the game. We think we did a really good job facing off and our wings, between our face-off guys and our, our wings coming up with those ground balls gave us a lot of possessions at the offensive end of the field. And uh, we wanted to make their offense watch as much as they, as they could, as we could. And uh, they did. And then when they uh, did, did get a couple opportunities, I thought our defense got some good stops. I thought Nick Mellon did a tremendous The Orange are now 7-3 and, and head to Chapel Hill on Saturday to face the Tar Heels. The Carrier Dome Roof Project will begin on March 1, 2020. In a statement released last week, the university said that all teams will vacate the dome by March 1st, so the heavy lifting on the roof project can begin. The university has not said yet how this will affect the later half of the men's and women's basketball schedule and where the men's and women's lacrosse team will play the rest of their home games during this time. The university did say that the plan is for the first home football game to be played on September 1st, 2020, under the new roof. That's your sports update. I'm Colin Watson. Go Orange. Still to come here on Mornings on the Hill, when I asked a group of new house you know, students have found an interesting new way to highlight the personalities of their professors. Stay with us for, the, for that story and more. Welcome back. Visual communication students are presumably the creative types. But they are taking that creativity to a whole new level. Our Ashton Hyren joins us now live in studio to tell us more. That's right guys. Well, designing a font from scratch seems like a pretty hard task. But how about designing one to mimic the character of one of your professors? Well, visual, communi visual communication students in Newhouse here have done just that. My typeface is called Essential. It's something that only has the necessaries. Professors are usually the ones analyzing students, but in Professor Claudia Strong's visual communications class, that's not the case. Have each student pick a different professor, someone with whom perhaps they have some sort of relationship or have had in class before. We had to look into the professor's personality as well as, as, well as their teaching style, and that's quite difficult for me because usually I want to represent myself in my work, but rather I was rep representing somebody else. The result? A typeface or a font, reflecting the character of a Newhouse professor, available for anyone to download. 
The final product can be found here in the lobby of Newhouse One. Strong says when professors often enter this room, they are overwhelmed with awe at the typeface that was created in their character. The person that inspired my typeface was Professor Bill Wordy. He said, you know me better than I know myself. And I thought that was crazy. And every year that Strong leads this project, she says it's still just as rewarding. So fabulous to not only see students translate, you know, one of my friends and colleagues' personality or character into a typeface, but it's wonderful to see them realize by the end that, oh my gosh, I really can design a typeface. The designs are still in progress, but you can find all 18 of them in the lobby of Newhouse One. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Ashton Hiron. I'm Sam Carter, and here's what's going on this weekend here on the Hill. The Cleveland, Cleveland Improv is in town, and they need an occupation, an item, and an audience. And if you'd like to check out some spot comedy, head down to the Funny, to the funny Bone. Their website says tickets are a quarter, so it's worth checking out. On Friday, now, if you love showing your friends how smart you are, and who doesn't, uh, you won't want to miss uh, the Shine Student Center, room 306. It's orange after dark trivia. It runs till midnight, so if you want to go out after, you can. Uh, if bumps in the night are more your thing, uh, on Saturday you can check out the Salt City Horror Fest. Uh, they'll be showing Jaws and Psycho, among others, all presented in beautiful 35 millimeter. Tickets are $30. Now, if you need to take it easy on Sunday, uh, and for some of us we could, maybe you need to check out um, the Celebration of Senses, uh, local flowers, and maybe a little music. And buy some arts and crafts. And uh, if that's your thing, admissions is free, so, you know, price is right. And it takes place at the Carol Watson Greenhouse. Uh, that's it for Weekends on the Hill. I'm Sam Carter. Thank you so much, Sam. And finally this morning, an impressive comic collection is here at SU. Memorabilia from the Archie Comics series is on display right now in Bird Library. The Archie Company started all the way back in the 1930s. The comics eventually turned into cartoons, movies, and video games. The exhibit is part of the university's Special Collections Research Center. You can find it on the first floor of Bird Library until mid-May. And that is going to do it for us on Mornings on the Hill this Wednesday. I'm Landon Wexler. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Alexandria Bennett. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday, live at 10 a.m., right here on OTN.